Welcome to Red Beard Radio. I'm Brian Keith, and today we are talking about the idea that how you do anything is how you do everything. When I got home from a trip recently, I had a victory, and I'm going to tell you about it. I actually went and unpacked my suitcase and my backpack all the way to putting those two things away where they belong and put everything else away. And this was a road trip. We've just been coming back from Sedona, a 1,500-mile drive just back from Sedona to our house. And my wife is looking at me saying, who did I marry? Because I've been that guy who's like, I'll deal with it. You know, put the suitcase in the side of your bedroom. I'll deal with it later. But when I got home and I was just, just whooped from this long drive, I thought, I'm going to go and embody this idea that how I do anything is how I do everything. I'm going to go be that guy. I'm going to be that guy that I want to be. And we have today another guy to help us talk through this idea. We have Riley Meek of the King's Council podcast. He's going to share some ideas with us. We're going to talk through how do you take this idea of how you do anything is how you do everything. How do you build that into your life and your business? Riley, welcome to the show. Hey, Brian. Happy to be here, man. So happy to have you here. Tell us about a time, maybe the first time, where you consciously took that idea of how you do anything is how you do everything and actually applied it to your life. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I feel like I have numerous examples of this, but probably one of the most common ones that everybody can usually relate to is, uh, and, and this is something that, that I really take notice with it when I meet new people is how well does somebody keep their car? Mm. And this could be actually, Brian, this could be like a gut check for a lot of people uh, because this really hit me when I when I first started to really think about this because oftentimes, you know, my car would be a complete travesty a mess we've all been there right where it's like it's just uh where we where we throw trash on the floor or whatever the case is but i really had that understanding of like man if i've if i've if i'm committed to excellence and and that's what i've chosen to do that is like one of my core values i should be excellent in everything that i do whether it's keeping my car nice and clean or uh, uh, you know, my room, I, we, we always teach our kids like, keep your room clean. And it's like, why is that? Is it to be just, just to have a clean room or is there a reason above and beyond it that, you know, an underlying message that we're trying to teach our kids uh, and how that's going to correlate to them as they, they grow into, you know, adults. And so what it, what it really hit home for me was like when I actually became a father, my daughter, who's 10 now and understanding that, she's watching. She's watching everything that I do more so than what I say, right? I, I grew up hearing a lot like do as I say, not as I do. And I always thought well, that's a bunch of crap, <laughs> right? <laughs> Adult lies. Exactly. And and so I think that was the, the biggest thing for me when I really understood that. And it's like, man, I'm committed to excellence. And no matter what, it doesn't have to be that I, I win at everything or that I'm, I'm, I'm going to be the best at everything, but I'm going to be the best possible uh that i can be right i'm not going to win any dunk contest but i I'm, I'm going to be when i play basketball i want to be the best i want to that i can be right when i'm whatever that is when i'm when i'm building my business i'm going to choose to operate in excellence and oftentimes that means not cutting corners right a, a big thing for for my daughter that that i recently instilled in her was we were shopping at target the other day and it was one of those times where, you know, we're, we're shopping and she wanted it. I forget even what it was, but it was a toy of some sort and we had it in the cart and then she found something else that she wanted and, and I had her make a decision. And so she went with the new, new item. And then ultimately she had to choose what she was going to do with that, that old item that she had wanted. And what oftentimes what we do, I've done this before. I'm sure you have too. It's like, we just set it down wherever we're at. Meanwhile, knowing that somebody else is going to have to take that that product and go put it back in its original place, and instantly she she was like she I could see it like the wheels turning in her head like yeah I've chosen to be excellent so I need to take this back to the place where I got it from, and that I mean what those those moments Brian I, that those are like where you're like okay I'm doing I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing as a parent as a leader mm -hmm. by leading by example so they can see the little things that we're doing equates or correlates to everything that they see us do. As you've been sharing the story, a new question has popped into my mind, which might take our direct our conversation a different direction. So let's find out. What do you do when you notice there's some aspect of your life or your business which you don't care enough or you're not willing to deploy the resources to 
have that same level of excellence. The analogy of the car that you're not willing to keep it as clean as you'd like. Mm -hmm. Do you, what's your process for divesting yourself? Because with your success, with your social dynamic selling system, all the companies you've worked with, all the sales you've created, you must have had to say no to a lot of projects, even ones you loved, kill them off so you could focus. So how yeah. do you, what's that process look like for Riley? Man, and this is, uh, this has been a process because I've, I've had to learn, you know, through just bad decisions in making that because I'm, I'm a people pleaser at heart. And so I, mm -hmm. I typically will take on too many tasks and then, and then realize that, you know what, I'm not operating in excellence and I'm not doing any of these really well. Therefore, nobody is getting served, in, including myself. And so going back to there's only a certain amount of things that we can actually control in our lives. And so if we yeah. can control the controllables, everything else will, will take care of itself. And so th I think that comes into play of like, okay, I can control how how my car is, right? The environment, because if, if, you're on, if you're on the road a lot, if you're driving in the car right now, listening to this, you probably spend a decent amount of your time in the vehicle. So shouldn't that be a representation of who you are as a, as a human being, right? Or if, if it's not the vehicle, maybe it's your office, maybe it's your desk. If you're looking at that cluttered mess of, of post-it notes everywhere, because this was me for a period of time in my life, like that's a representation of, of, of how we think and, and, and how, we, uh, how we should be operating or, or how we are operating, but maybe not how we should be. And so it, a lot of it comes back to living a life by design versus by default. And and mm -hmm. so many of us are just operating in in default mode and and usually default is like whatever's easiest. And and it, a lot of it comes back to the the pain of 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 discipline or, or the pain of of regret, right? So sometimes I have to choose certain things that I'm going to I'm going to alloc allocate my time to in order to operate in excellence not because I want to, but because that's that's part of the core values of who I am. Not because I'm an OCD person, or because I I don't I don't care about clutter, or or I do care about clutter, but it's it's about who I'm I'm called to be, who I've just already decided to be well in advance, and you know that's really why through our our coaching programs, you know, we talk a lot about having core values and understanding who we are and and why we make those decisions well in advance, so when the going gets tough or times do come at it or we get two items and we have to make a decision right then like man i could be late but you know what I, i'm called to excellence before before that and so i'm going to take this item and put it back where it's supposed to be because i know that's who i've already decided to be uh and then you know not filling your plate too full and in knowing where you you have margin built into to allocate certain time towards certain things um and this doesn't happen overnight brian like this is something that you have to gradually and, and just, you know, consistently start to put these and implement these changes into your life. So you can live that life actually by design, like I mentioned, versus just letting life happen at us or, or to us for that matter. I love the core values focus. And I love building a narrative around the core values. Uh, for me, for my company, Redbeard, the core values go like this in order, truth, kindness, focus, speed, and victory. And I have a story around those five and where they come from. Like number one, truth. My family motto is Veritas Vincent. It's been our family motto for a thousand years. It means truth conquers. So Love you know, it. even if you can't be kind, you can at least always speak the truth. And then there's a story around. If you try to go fast, and, and it's also an anti-story. The being kind but without being honest doesn't work long term. Uh, being fast without being focused it doesn't work long term. It just feels good in the moment, but you're you're dooming yourself. And that you have to have all four of these things to get to victory. And if you try to skimp on any one of the four, you're not going to get a sustained victory. So I have this narrative, both for myself, for my clients, for staff, where we can say, here's what we're doing together. You're talking about messy desks. And I, I thought about, yeah, I have a process because I have you know, a house, uh, an outside of my house, got automobiles to maintain, got a big garden, got two businesses. And I think, yeah, I have a system and it's this. I make the bed every morning. And then if I can't do anything else to order my life, the next thing I do is I vacuum the bedroom floor because the bedroom's relatively small compared to all of the other projects out there. And I can always go vacuum it, that I can always take the action to increase the level of order in my life. And then I know when I'm done with my day and I go into the bedroom, what am I telling myself? I see this evidence, right? Oh, the bed's made. Mm. Oh, the floor feels clean on my feet. Ah, 
I feel I see this evidence of here's who I am, even if the day was chaotic, which happens sometimes. I'm curious for you, Riley, what is one or two of those things that you build into your life, those little touchstones where you're able, and what do you tell your clients to build those in, those touchstones of here's who I am? That's good, man. I love those examples you gave. So that's, I mean, that's right in the lines of a book that I, I love. I oftentimes suggest people to read is, is make your bed. And, and it, the, you know, the premise of that is, is essentially like wake up and do something that it's getting yourself to do those, the, the little things. And so the, the big things for me, Brian, is putting those proper triggers in place because we all have triggers and, you know, so, sometimes it's, uh, for me, for a good period of time, it was like the moment that I would get done with with the day or off of my coaching calls or something, it was like, that was the trigger for me to go have a glass of wine, right? And then I realized that one glass went to two and three and four. And, yeah. and, and th 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 those were unhealthy triggers. So I had to put in different triggers that would replace those because we're all creatures of, of habit. Like we're, yeah. we're, we're, we do things uh, and we, we end up become just those methodical, like we're, we want to have those, those things that we, we grasp. I mean, oftentimes it becomes a, a rut or a routine more so just living in that rhythm of life. And so, uh, those small triggers in place. And I love how you do it. This just to start the day. Um, uh, ones for me to start the day, man, is I, I do feet hit the ground water. I pound like ha, it's a nice. stupid little saying, right? But it's like that. No, I know then I've just gone probably seven or eight hours without any water. I'm dehydrated. And so just instinctively, the first thing that I do is either grab the water by my bed or I, I groggily walk to the kitchen and I'm, I'm pounding probably 12 to 20 ounces of water right then and there to, to get me going for the day. Um, and so from there, then I can, you know, I go to my vitamins and I, I have these triggers that, that put things in place. And so some of us have uh, more, more so unhealthy triggers that yeah. cause things. And I think the, the big thing is self-identification of like, okay, I know when I scroll social media for more than three minutes, my blood pressure goes up, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a bad trigger, right? So what what things can you do to, to replace those? Because just to start from scratch and say, okay, I'm going to do none of that. I certainly wouldn't recommend that, but I would, because it's, that's not going to be something that's going to be long lasting because our self will yeah. is, is only, it, it's only goes to a, a certain extent. Right. And I my challenging triggers are the ones where it's combined good and bad behavior. Uh, do you know what an aura ring is? You ever used one of those? You bet, man, you bet. Yeah. So I have one. I, at times I've used it constantly at other, other times just for sleep tracking. And so what I want to do when I get out of bed, I also just started using this chilly sleep thing, which cools your bed. Do, so you do you love it? Uh, okay. So this is now turned into a chilly <laughs> sleep ad. I've used this thing for five nights. I have had severe problems with deep sleep. I get between 15 to 30 minutes of deep sleep in the average night, which for folks who have not studied deep sleep means I'm a zombie all the time and have been since I started tracking with or two and a half years ago. In five nights of using chilly sleep, I now get uh, my lowest is 53 minutes. My most I think is an hour and a half of deep sleep. Amazing. Insane results. Also, yes. my resting heart rate was roughly 55 on average over the last two and a half years. In January, I got COVID. It then raised it about 60. So five yep. beats per minute, resting heart rate increase that appeared permanent. Didn't really go below 58 at night, mostly 60. I thought, well, that sucks. But there's a lot, a lot of literature supports that's what happens when you get COVID. So my resting heart rate is now down lower than it's ever been. Uh, a low night is now 52. A high night is 55. A high is now my average before COVID after five nights. And then yeah. we also have my heart rate variability or is actually why I stopped drinking. I barely ever drink anymore. I used to have a cider after work. Same thing you're talking about. One glass of wine yes. for me was cider. Okay. I had an occasion have two. Wasn't getting drunk, just one or two. Chill out, have some space in the day. Not bad, right? Well, looked at my aura data, which measures, measures HRV, which for folks who aren't familiar, that basically measures how stressed out your body is. Higher number means you're more relaxed. Lower number means you're more stressed out. And what I found was that one drink was as if I had done a lot of serious work that day, like gone for a long run, or like, like done a lot of work though, really stressed out. Two drinks was as if I just climbed halfway up Mount Rainier, like spent yep. the entire day in the mountains. And I was shocked, even when I didn't feel in terms of just how I felt in my body, like I was really beating myself up. Two ciders in an evening, a casual, a bit more than average evening 
was as if I had just climbed a mountain, but without any of the physical benefits of that training. And I was shocked. And I, I, that be, this got became aware, aware to me. Once I became aware of it, I was like, wow. So am I going to keep on having a cider in the evening? No, because between the alcohol and the sugar, that right there is just tanking me. Yes. So back to Bro, we the are, HR. We, yeah, we are like the same human being because I've, I've recently done this. And that's, I've, that's why I haven't drank in over six weeks now. Yeah. Because of that. I use Whoop, so not Aura. So um, I used Whoop. I'm returning okay. it right now because it's tracking. Sleep tracking is so off. I, Bro, I, track, I just said this to my wife. <laughs> I, so I, folks, this is now a biohacking episode. Sorry. Uh, or you're right? welcome. One of those. So I have two and a half years of dad with Aura. Now it could be off as well, but in terms of looking at its own data, it's probably accurate ish. Like if, if Aura says I got 15 minutes of deep sleep last night, but an hour tonight, I'm going to trust that I got substantially more sleep tonight than last night. Right. Yep. So I tried whoop. I was like, Oh, this is pretty interesting. See on the rest, not so much fun, whatever. But I'm interested in better measuring strain uh, and aura because it's a ring. It gets in the way of weightlifting. So weightlifting, I have to go take off my aura ring. So I can't track that thing or other working with my hands. So I can't track that, which I really want to track in terms of activity. Not great. Rowing machine doesn't work very well. So, okay, I'll try it. Whoop. Well, one night, I think, okay, I'll, I'll test the two out. Aura says I get 38 minutes of deep sleep. This is before the chilly sleep. 38 minutes, which is a darn good night. That same night, Whoop says an hour and 43 minutes of deep sleep. Wow. I think, come on, guys. Now, maybe Whoop is more accurate and Aura is always inaccurate. I, I don't actually know. I can't tell. Sure. But the fact that it was so different, and I think I did this for two nights. I was like, okay, Whoop is just so inaccurate and that this is not usable data. Why would I trust any data coming out of this device? Mm -hmm. Better to trust a single data for which I have, a single tool for which I have two and a half years of data, and then make decisions in my behavior based on that, like checking out when is my last meal of the day? Am I fasting? Am I, am I doing a OMAD? Am I, how much am I moving today? How much did I sweat today? How much water did I drink? How much alcohol did I drink? How much sugar did I eat? And looking at all that with a single data source, I think for me makes more sense. Sure. Other folks love Whoop. I'm like, man, if that's your thing, fantastic. But here's the point of all the story was to get back to the point. <laughs> here's my bad habit, Riley. I want to see how I slept last night, especially right now when my sleep appears to have changed so dramatically. Well, how do you get your data off your Aura Ring? You turn on your phone. My phone's always off at night. Yeah. Turn on my phone. I look at the Aura data. I now have my phone, the greatest distraction device known to humankind, right. in my hand in the morning, which is the worst possible time. When I have not cared as much, my phone stays off sometimes halfway through the day, sometimes until I'm after done with work for the day, which those days are, of course, my most productive days. But now here I am looking at my phone at my most important moments of my day because I want to know. Yep. What was my deep sleep last night? It was like 53 minutes again, even though I tossed and turned all night. Still 53 minutes. And I can see, or it tells me, here's exactly what's happening. I'm getting my standard deep sleep just after going to bed. But then unlike ever in the past, I'm now getting second, third, fourth bouts of deep sleep in the second quarter of the night. It's incredible. Amazing. So I have my phone in my hand. Oh man, this is the worst thing. And I'm sort of groggy because I just got up trying to go turn that sucker off and put it back down, that's hard. Right. And they're, and they're tied together, right? I'm, trying, I'm doing a good thing for myself, which exposes me to making a bad decision. What are yeah. you finding with your coaching clients when people have these good and bad decisions married together or they expose themselves to bad decisions? How do you help your clients address that to avoid falling into that pit of doom that is yeah. whatever their bad habits are? That's so good, man. I... I I've literally had this discussion about a week and a half ago with a client actually, because I'm in the same boat as you, man, because I, and here, here's I, what I would figure out is really try to get to the, the root of why do I care about what that information says? Because I was doing the same thing and I, and heck I did it this morning where it's like, <laughs> I, I was looking at it and then, and then what I found myself doing, Brian, is I was allowing the results of what already happened affect how I thought I was going to perform during the day. Like, Ooh. did I actually recover? And I'm like, oh my gosh, I feel fine. But this says I was like in the red recovery. That's, you know, yeah. what, what is. and then I'm like, that's in the back of my mind. So it's like, yeah. is this, it all really comes down to, is it serving me or am I serving it? And Ooh, yeah. that's really what it boiled down to me where even this morning I had that same, com th you know, internal conversation of like, why do I care so much about this? And partly it is us. If you, I'm, I'm a 
I measure everything because you can't manage what you don't measure. Uh-huh. And so I want to, I want to manage this stuff, but am I going to allow that to dictate how I feel throughout the day? Absolutely not. So I, I would draw a hard line on that man and being like, listen, how I'm going to wake up, I'm going to do what I do because of, of the disciplines that I put in place. And then, you know, during my 10 o'clock, uh, uh, yeah. break, then I'll check my data, but, yeah. but not letting it, or maybe even do it, put it not on the front of your app of your phone where it's like readily available and accessible where sometimes I'll just be like taking a peek at it. It's like, Oh, what strain do I have today? And it's like, who cares? Like go through the day and then maybe just give yourself 10, 15 minutes at night before you wind down to check it versus having access to it all day long. Yeah. I, I like the aura tells me about my target activity level but I mostly only use it in two cases and they're the extreme cases. One is if I'm planning for a really serious day in the mountains, like climbing halfway up to Mount Rainier, if aura tells me I am beat up and I don't notice it, I will reevaluate how hard I'm going to push myself. If I'm already pushing myself like at a nine or 10 intensity level, I might scale it back or just make an extra contingency plan to scale back. You bet. Uh, and then the other side is, if Aura uh, tells me that I'm either really beat up or really, really well rested, I might uh, add a bit of exercise or take away a bit of exercise from my day or, or like say, okay, it says I'm really beat up from last night. I'm going to pay extra attention to not being on technology after 8 p.m. Like a yeah. little tweak there. Uh, but beyond that, I most like, I don't wear O-ring during the day at all. I just look at the night data, which gives me this, how well recovered are you? Mm, so yeah. okay this has been a biohacking episode as it turns out riley for people who like how you think they want to hear about your coaching program they want to hear about your sales program any of that stuff where can people go find you best spot man is going to be if they're if they're listening to this radio show i've got a podcast called the king's council podcast uh which can be found on any of the main networks but uh king's council uh we've got multiple links in which they can subscribe or, or follow it there and who is the listener? Who's like my target listener is six figure entrepreneurs who will recognize that they need to go beyond having a couple VAs and really build out their teams and scale their companies. What's your target audience for the King's Council podcast? Bro, that's that's exactly it. And and the King's Council is really it's 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 a it's a ministry essentially. We're we're a mm-hmm. faith based organization, um, but personally, then uh, that's who I love to serve is the younger new entrepreneur that doesn't necessarily know. Whether it's you know much about business or, or how to grow or scale a company, but you got to you got to grow before you can scale. Um, who I love working with and really the the coaching um, that we mostly work with is that six to seven figure earner or looking to go to eight, uh, and and that's what we have within our, our coaching program. So all of it though is is really I mean believe it or not, the Bible is is basically the playbook that I run off of on, to operate my companies, and I, I really believe God's given us that the blueprint to to crush life like to whether we're looking to create something uh but that operating in excellence on how we do anything is how we do everything i get that from reading the bible and that that's what we coach and teach on as well so kingdom entrepreneurs is is really um our our listener or our our, our ideal client for the king's council it's an interesting thing it comes back to the ability to focus and to ignore most of whatever is in your environment that yes. if you say well use the bible to run your business well which parts Right. If you say like, well, this one sentence that use that, well, okay, maybe that's going to be good. Maybe it's going to be a bit too <laughs> myopic. Uh, use the whole thing. That doesn't work either. That knowing what to focus on, what to ignore, at least for now. Yeah. Critical. That's that's great, man. That's Riley, like saying use the encyclopedia to form a sentence. Yeah. Like, huh? what? That's not so useful. <laughs> right. Riley, thank you for being on Redbeard Radio and thank you for validating my feelings on how Whoop is not great at sleep tracking. I feel like. <laughs> Love it, Brian. Great conversation. You you take care. Yes.